Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Today I'm going to be taking a look at the Pathfinder 2nd Edition Remaster Player Core 2. So this is one of the newest releases for the Pathfinder 2nd Edition role-playing game. And as is dictated by the green 2nd Edition marker on the top here, this is for uh, the remastered version of the Pathfinder 2nd Edition role-playing game, which uses the Orc license as opposed to the 3rd uh, Edition OGL. Now, this book was sent to me by Paizo for the purposes of helping to promote and make videos on and stuff like that. So I really do want to thank them for sending this my way. However, as is always the case with these videos, I'm not uh, being uh, pre-screened or scripted or anything like that in these videos. The opinions that I express are 100% completely and totally my own. I will admit, though, at the very beginning here that Pathfinder 2nd Edition is one of my favorite modern RPGs. So, spoilers, I'm going to recommend this book. <laughs> I actually really do uh, like this, and I think this is a great addition to the 2nd Edition remastered version of the Pathfinder role-playing game. So, we're not going to do like a full comprehensive flip-through or anything like that, um, but we will take a look at some of the stuff in here. So, we have for our new Ancestries, we have the Cat Folk, uh, the Hobgoblin, the, the Colo, which is like your Knoll, uh, Kobold, Lizard Folk, uh, Rat Folk, which are the Yoski, Ian Starfinder, uh, Tengu, and the Tripki, so the, the frog-like individuals. So, you got a bit of a... Uh, a bit of a variety here as well. It's cool to see like classics like the kobold uh, and the the hobgoblin lizard folk in there. And I have a friend who you know really likes playing cat folk characters. So I'm sure once his if his current character were to perish, I'm pretty sure that this is going to be uh, what he'll make next. As for your classes, you have the alchemist, barbarian, champion, investigator, monk, oracle, sorcerer, and swashbuckler. So this completes the classes that were in the original Pathfinder 2nd Edition core book, as well as the classes that were introduced in the Advanced Player's Guide. So they were split up uh, in the different uh, player cores. The Witch made its way into the Player Core 1, kind of taking the Sorcerer's Place, and uh, in that core rule book, but we do have them all here as well. We're not going to look too deeply into these classes. Uh, I am doing my Through the Ages series on the Paladin, and we're getting into the second edition Pathfinder Paladins uh, like now, which is what the champions uh, were to sort of derived from or what they came from. Uh, so I got the second edition playtest, the second edition uh, Paladin or the champion video and the remaster champion. Uh, but we'll take a look at things like the alchemist here really quick because I think they did a really good job with the uh, with the alchemist. We're just going to kind of skip through uh, some of these new. Uh, oh, yeah, you also get like a slew of new backgrounds. You also get some uh, versatile heritages, which can be uh, play or which can be attached to any ancestry. So you have like the uh, the damp fear, which is like the half. Um, uh, sort of like the half vampire, and you got a few others there, so that's pretty cool to see. We got some rare backgrounds, and then we've got our alchemist here. So one of the biggest things uh, that they changed with the alchemist uh, in this version there that I was able to notice pretty quickly is they had their like advanced alchemy here, uh, which you have like you had I think it was like ten or a, cer a set number of infused reagents you could create every day and you could use them to make like batches of alchemical bombs or mutagens or uh, things along those lines so here with the advanced alchemy you can craft a number of alchemical items equal to four plus your intelligence modifier and each item must be in your formula book but you also get these versatile vials um, so the versatile vials uh, you know how to prepare fast-acting chemicals into versatile vials, special items that can be used as bombs and can be turned to other alchemical items by introducing special reagents. During your daily preparations, you can create a number of versatile vials equal to 2 plus your intelligence modifier, um, which is also your maximum number of vials. Uh, if you're below your maximum number, you can gather reagents from the environment around you. For every 10 minutes spent in exploration mode, you regain two vials. So that's actually really cool because you can sort of keep, 
using these for your main, um, like your, if you're a bomber, for example, um, you've got like the versatile vial. They start off with um, doing like acid damage, but depending on your specialization as an alchemist, you can change them to other things. But with the quick alchemy, you can also just create a versatile vial that can be used only as a bomb uh, for the versatile vial option from your research field. Uh, I guess that's like their specialization. Uh, and it only lasts till the end of your turn. So basically, you can always spend an action to just be able to create something quickly and be able to use it that same round. And I know they had stuff like that before, uh, but I think it ended up using like their infused reagents from the advanced alchemy. Uh, here, it just seems to be something that they can uh, that they can do um, as an option here. So that really adds a little bit of versatility to them. Again, they've got their versatile vials that they can spend time uh, getting back and they'll last for the day. Or if you're really in a pinch, uh, you can, uh, you can just create one quickly that will only last for the round. So you basically can like make a bomb for it there. And we do have like the bomber there. Uh, their field vials, when you strike the versatile vial, you can choose to have it deal cold, electricity, or fire damage instead of acid. So that's where you get your energy types in. There's also a really cool thing for the, uh, the alchemist in particular here is that in the treasure trove section of the book towards the end, uh, it does have all of the uh, alchemical items all listed uh, there for you. So you can get like the formulas or you just know exactly where to find them. It's a little bit better than having to go into the treasure section of the GM core or in the original uh, uh, core rulebook, having to go into like, again, the GM section to get the information on your bombs. So having that table there with all the alchemical items right in the back of this book makes it you know pretty handy there. So I just thought that, that was really, really cool. Um, and again, I'm not gonna go into all the uh, all the details there, but I also love that artwork uh, with the uh, the goblin uh, casually chugging one of his uh, items there while lobbing a bomb. Uh, just to add some, uh, I guess, were rats is probably what they are there. So that's uh, pretty cool to see. We also have the uh, the barbarian here, and again, not much that I can notice immediately for changes. Uh, the one thing I do notice though is that they can seem to take their rage more often or more frequently now. Uh, before, I think they had to wait a minute between uh, rages, so if they lost their rage for whatever reason. Uh, so now you can rage, uh, basically if you're not already raging, or you, if you have like the fatigue condition, which you don't actually get from raging uh, by default. Um, but you can't gain the extra bonus uh, temporary hit points uh, from your rage if you've already raged within the last minute. So it's just kind of a little a little change there as well. But again, we're not going to go into absolutely everything. We do have all kinds of different classes here. Like I said, we got the champion uh, where alignment has been taken out. They have the uh, you know holy and unholy. They have their edicts and anathema, which is depends on which cause that you end up taking. Uh, which sort of defines your moral code as opposed to it just being hardwired into like the default version of the uh, of the class there. So you still choose a deity, you still kind of follow um, their moral compass, so to speak. Uh, but there are some other changes there, which we'll take a look at again when I do uh, the video on that. And again, we're just going to skip ahead a little bit here. We do have the investigator class, which truthfully... It's not my favorite of the classes that's in this book. It's the one that I'm probably least likely to, to play, uh, aside from maybe the monks. I've just never liked the monk class. It's still interesting. Like, you can use, um, you know, it's a more cerebral type of character, I guess. Uh, and I think it would work really well in certain types of campaigns. But, like, the style of game that I'm running right now, I don't know how well... Um, investigator would work in that but for example if you're running something a little more um, like you know uh, Lovecraftian or even just like in you know the players are based in a city and you could have like the investigator doing like murder mysteries or things like that like that would be a lot of fun um, but it's just not like the most interesting class as far as I'm concerned but I think it's still it's still a cool concept 
and it works really well within certain uh, certain niche uh, adventure styles. It's just not the style of game that I'm currently running or a style of game that I'm currently playing in. Uh, but there we go. We still have them. We got the monk, uh, you know, which is always my least favorite class. I'm not going to lie here. We do have the oracle as well, and the oracle is kind of interesting. I don't want to go through too much of the... The, uh, the class here, but we do have the uh, the Oracle class, and they're kind of cool. Uh, they might be one of my favorite like spell casting classes in Pathfinder 2e. Um, they're you know, like the witch is a really cool concept as well because like you're you know you, it's almost like different sides of the same coin. With like the witch, you're getting power from a patron um, that you've sort of made some sort of like deal with, um, or you're you're getting. The, the patron's getting something out of them lending you power. The Oracle, on the other hand, is a character that's kind of either, like, stolen their magical abilities or they've accessed them in a way that they weren't intended to. And they can access those uh, magical abilities, but it comes with a uh, it comes with a curse. And you can have different things happen to you. Like, you get these uh, these focus spells that you can cast... Which are usually pretty good, but when you do them, it increases the rating of your curse, and uh, like bad things can happen as you like get more and more as your curse kind of grows more and more within you. Uh, my favorite one will always be um, the uh, the undead or the death version of the oracle. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, you should go to Master the Game's channel, and uh, we didn't get to finish it, unfortunately, which kind of sucks. Um, but we were doing a playthrough of the uh, Fall of Plaguestone adventure, and one of the players there was playing an oracle with the death one, uh, Balthazar, and he was definitely the highlight of that entire uh, of that entire campaign. It was a great group. Uh, everybody was awesome there, except for me. I really don't think I belonged in that group. Like everybody was so. Everybody was so entertaining, and then I was just there. But uh, it was a really fun game, and the Oracle uh, Balthazar really... I think it was Balthazar was the name. It's been a little while now, but he was he was awesome. It was, it was just great. It was just a great time. Uh, and then you also got like, the Sorcerer and the Swashbuckler. But the Swashbuckler, I, they did give them uh, some things that give them uh, an easier time getting their panache, uh, which they have to do, perform certain things in order to do. You have to get... Um, I think if it has the Flourish... Uh, trait name and you perform the action that has like the flourish trait uh, it grants you panache once you complete it um, so we've got like the dastardly dash which has the flourish ability so if you if you can use that you pull it off then you get uh, panache which you can use uh, to get <clears throat> empowering your strikes or you can also spend your panache to deliver like a finishing move uh, in my pathfinder game uh, one of the players was playing a swashbuckler um, but when we switched over to Starfinder, because he was missing from the session where that happened, he decided to make an operative from Starfinder instead. But it'll be cool to go back to. Uh, it'll be cool to go back to this character. Now the new classes are great, uh, or to, have to fill out the class roster from the original uh, core rulebook was was fantastic. But in my opinion, the best aspect of this book would have to be. The archetypes. So archetypes in Pathfinder Second Edition, there is no like standard multi-classing um, like you do in like you know my modern like Fifth Edition or stuff like that. And I think the game is all the better for it. Instead, when you would gain a level where you can gain a class feat, you can instead choose to take the dedication feat. Uh, from one of these archetypes. Now, a lot of the early ones in this book are going to be like just your multi-class. Uh, uh, archetypes. So if you wanted to dabble into alchemist or barbarian or stuff like that, they have that available, but they also have some other really awesome, just like thematic uh, archetypes that you can get into. And a few of my favorites have to be, number one, you have the dandy. Uh, so you are a genteel master of style, culture, and decorum, aware of even the subtlest rules of etiquette. So just like making a like a noble character with like the dandy dedication, I think would be a lot of fun. You have like abilities like distracting flattery. <laughs> so if somebody in your group commits a faux pas, 
you can use your reaction to try to like roll uh, a skill check uh, or deception check against the target's will DC um, to essentially try to turn it into um, like a lighthearted moment of brevity as opposed to like just another character being uncouth or unbecoming. So I thought that's really awesome. You've also got things like the Archer dedication and the Eldritch Archer, which are two different things. Um, where the Eldritch Archer is a higher level one for you to be able to start it, but you do get to empower your bows with like uh, spells and stuff like that. It's pretty cool, whereas the regular Archer doesn't do any of that. They're just better at uh, basic archery skills or crossbow, because uh, crossbow's in there as well. But we've also got some really cool stuff, like there's the Scout. There's a character that works relies heavily on using like scrolls. You have um, like the uh, the talisman dabbler, but then you've also got like the vigilante, which like tell me that's not Batman. I've shown the picture to a few different people in my gaming group at different times, and Batman was the first thing that always came up. So you can literally uh, become a you can literally become like a crime fighter vigilante. And what's also kind of cool is if you have like an animal companion or a minion of any sort, um, you can actually uh, use the, you can have them be like disguised as well, uh, which I think is just kind of cool. Uh, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just neat. Like, it's like, so the archetypes are what like prestige classes should have been. Uh, they, I just think that they're a better version of it. And I'm all in on uh, on the way that these work. But there's also a couple of other ones here. Like we got the Viking. We have the Weapon Improviser. And then we've got the Wrestler. Which is something that I would definitely consider making there. They have like submission holds. So you can put them in the Sharpshooter. Uh, elbow Breaker. Uh, you have the, I think, Suplex is one. Aerial Pile Driver. You better believe if I made a uh, if I made a wrestler archetype, that aerial pile driver would be fully described as a tombstone. Uh, but yeah, just really, really cool stuff. And the book also adds a whole bunch of new feats, uh, a whole bunch of new spells, and some new items in here as well. Again, we had mentioned that it has the alchemical stuff, but there's also some other uh, magical equipment that's kind of geared a bit more towards the classes that are found inside of this book, rather than having them appear before time in the GM core, uh, where you don't necessarily have classes that can take full advantage of them. But yeah, there's some awesome stuff in here. And overall, I just think this is a really good addition to the Pathfinder 2nd Edition Remaster lineup. Which I believe at this point, this kind of completes that. So we've got all the core books out now. We have the Monster Core, the GM Core, the Player Core 1 and 2. I'm sure that we'll see other Monster Cores uh, coming out in the future. We had three Bestiaries. I wouldn't be surprised if we get a couple more, like, um, or at least one more Monster Core book um, for, like, the, the remastered version as well. But similar to, um, like, with the remastered stuff, if you have the older... Uh, books they're still fully usable uh, with the current version you just might have to convert some terminology uh, for example things like the summoner or the magus from uh, secrets of magic like where they're spell casters you would just replace the word spell level with spell rank uh, but they're still fully usable characters i had characters from the uh, original second edition core rule book um, being used at the same time as characters from the player core. So it is a very compatible, like backwards compatible system. It's just some spells have changed their like their names or like spell levels have turned to ranks and stuff like that. So you can definitely still get use out of your older uh, Pathfinder second edition books. You don't have to go and like worry that they've been rendered obsolete or anything like that. They are still fully usable. And uh, I just wanted to like throw that out there because I know some people were kind of concerned about that. Um, but I would say that they have made some good modifications to the classes from the original core rulebook. So if nothing else, I do definitely recommend the player core one and two for your groups. And we have the original, like this is the standard retail cover here, but I also ended up picking up the sketch cover 
uh, variant as well. So I have the sketch covers for the player core one and the player core two. That's as far as I'm going to go with the sketch covers. I don't care about getting them for the GM core, or the monster core. I just wanted them for the uh, the player core books. I think they're kind of neat. And uh, yeah, these are actually really cool. Uh, seeing like the early concept art, um, how it started and kind of how it turned out there. And it's kind of cool to see like the shading techniques, stuff like that. It's also a sort of a matte finish on the front cover except for the pathfinder the second edition and the player core stuff too down here uh which is actually sort of like a glossy uh layer that's been added to it but yeah just again a really really cool book the back is the same but it has a matte finish to it and i think this is again a great addition to your pathfinder second edition uh library if you're especially if you're into the uh, the remaster or if you're just getting into pathfinder second edition now then the player core one and two are books that i highly recommend uh checking out uh, especially the player core one because that has like the combat rules and all that stuff in there but the player core two makes for a great follow-up purchase once you've gotten a bit more familiar with Pathfinder 2nd Edition. So, let me know in the comments below. Have you picked up the Player Core 2? What's your favorite class from the Player Core 2? And uh, what archetypes have you used? Or which ones would you want to use from the book? I definitely want to make either a Dandy uh, or a Vigilante or a Wrestler. I just think that's really cool. The concept of making like Viking characters is kind of neat as well. And there's just a whole slew of other ones in there that are great. I don't want to spoil everything. So if you're interested, uh, check this out at your local uh, game store or wherever it is that you can pick up your role-playing game supplies. Thank you once again to Paizo for sending this out to me. I really appreciate it. And thank you to each and every one of you who have taken time out of your day to watch this video. It really does mean the world to me. Until next time, take care.